All right, hello. We are in the last week of the first quarter. So we have learned so many things that we are gonna take the next couple of class days to go backwards and review and think about what we've learned. Um, now, little complication about next school week. Friday, no school. Wednesday, PSAT. So we only have a couple of days. So that's why you're getting this video a little early. We're gonna spend Monday and Tuesday reviewing. And then on Thursday, I am gonna give you a short assessment going over the concepts. There will be two questions from each concept. So like for unit one, a number system, a numbers, there'll be two questions. So we've learned four different concepts. So there'll be a total of eight questions. Each concept will be graded out of five. It's a mastery based scale um, on how well you're doing on it. Um, a five out of five is everything looks really good. A four and a half out of five was like really, really, really good, but a couple of little mistakes. Um, so it's going to be an eight question um, assessment. Now it's going over everything we've already learned. So this is nothing new. We're going back and re-talking about what we've already talked about. Um, this video is help, going to help you review that. We will have practice problems on these, um, these items all week. Uh, you'll be receiving those on, on Monday and Tuesday. There'll be some in Schoology and some on paper. The assessment you're gonna take is all on paper. So let's go ahead and talk about what we, what we learned about. So classifying numbers as rational or irrational, ordering numbers on a number line, solving a square equation, and solving a cube equation. All right, so rational versus irrational. I do wanna just take a quick second to remind you, okay, that rational is any whole, fraction or decimal that repeats or terminates, okay? And then irrational would be things like pi and the square root of 75 where it's not a whole number. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that as the video goes on. Um, we're gonna order things on the number line. You guys were great at that. That's pretty self-explanatory. Solving a squared and a cubed equation might look like this. So like x squared equals 16. We take the square root of both sides. We get x equals plus or minus four. The other thing we had was the cube root. Okay, so we might have the cube root or the cube of um, x equals 27. And then we could go ahead and we would cube root both sides. So we'll talk about that again in a minute. Um, we also learned about the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, just to give you a quick reminder, if we have any right triangle, okay, there's a right triangle, there's the right angle, this is the leg, this is the other leg, this is the hypotenuse, okay, what we know is that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Okay, where our legs are a and b and our hypotenuse is c. We know it's the hypotenuse because it's across from the right triangle. Okay, so we'll see a couple of problems here in a minute on those. We just talked about exponents. So the first exponent rule is product of powers. So that'd be things like uh, x squared times x cubed would equal x to the fifth. Um, power to a power would be x squared to the third. Remember, we multiply here, that's six. Quotient of powers, that'd be like x to the seventh over x to the second, which would be x to the fifth. We subtract seven minus two. And then a negative exponent. If we ever have like x to the negative third, I have to rewrite this as one over x to the third. It's gotta go in the bottom part of the fraction. Okay, very, very, very simple stuff with that. And then scientific notation, you just literally took a quick check on this. Remember, A times 10 to the N, where A is between one and uh, 10, and then N is an integer, okay? So there's just a real quick review on some of those topics. I will teach about these a little bit uh, in class on Monday and Tuesday, and you'll have plenty of time to practice. All right, so here we go. Rational versus irrational. Let's look at the first one. It's a fraction, okay? So this one is rational. The second one has pi, that's irrational. 
anything with pi is irrational. The third one, well, that simplifies to be five. So that one is rational. The square root of 10, 10 is not a perfect number. So that one is irrational. The square root, or sorry, 9.75. Do you see how that ends? That's what we call terminating. So terminating decimals are always rational. And now this other one kind of is going on and on and on, and there's no pattern, so that one's irrational. The thing I should have included on this list, which I'm just realizing, is something like this, 9.3333, da, 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 where we would write it like this, 9.3 with the line over it. That one is also rational. That's a repeating decimal. There's the repeating. All right, now, next thing. Placing numbers on a number line. Um, again, you guys were great at this. 8.78, remember we're at, we're estimating. So 8.78 is more than eight and a half. It's almost nine. So we're gonna put that right there, 8.78. Uh, negative 5.82, that is almost six. Remember we're estimating. Uh, the square root of 19. Okay, well, I can use my calculator there. I can use my thinking, knowing that it's a little bit more than the square root of 16. Because remember, we talked about this. The square root of 16 is 4, and the square root of 25 is 5. So it has to be between 4 and 5. So 4.35, that's an irrational number, by the way. But we can still put it on the decimal, or on the number line, about there. So there is the square root of 19. Okay, so rational versus irrational. Fractions versus Fractions, whole numbers, and terminating or repeating decimals are rational. Irrational is kind of everything else. Um, all right, solving a squared equation. I'm just realizing I made a bit of a mistake. Oh, no, I did talk about plus or minus four up there. Okay, coming back. We need to square root both sides of this equation. So we get x equals. We go to our calculator. We type in the square root of 138. It gives me 11.7, 11.75. I'm going to write that down. But I also know that negative 11.75 is an answer because there are, it's a squared equation. There are two solutions. All right, next, we are going to cube root both sides of this equation. We will get x on the left. I need to go into my calculator and type in the cube roots. Okay, that button, if you remember, is to the left. Look at pi and above what's called cosine. There's the n square root button. You're going to type in a 3. And then under that, you're going to type in negative 343. That gives us negative 7 as an answer. Negative 7 is the only answer. To a cubed equation, there is only one answer. So in review... S solving a square, solving a cube. You square root or cube root. For a square, there are two solutions. For a cube, there is one solution. All right, next problems. Finding um, the hypotenuse for a right triangle. Remember, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So c is across from here. That's here. That is my x. So that would make my A and my B 12 and 14. Now, this is where we talked about adding because we're finding the hypotenuse. So let's go to our calculator. Let's do 12 squared and 14 squared. That gives us 340. We then square root the answer. Hopefully this is coming back. Okay, we've, we've talked about this before. We round that answer. We will get 18.4. Four. That makes sense. The hypotenuse is the longest leg of the triangle. 18.44 is longer than 12 and 14. That makes sense. All right, let's look at this other one. Here, we're finding a leg. Okay, C is the 23. That makes my X A and my 18 B. So now we have X squared plus 18 squared equals 23 squared. This is where we're going to end up subtracting because the leg is going to be smaller than the hypotenuse. So what we have to do is subtract the 18 squared over. 
you guys struggled only with deciding if you were subtracting or not in the middle of the problem. So now I'm going to go in to my calculator and type that in. I'm not sure what happened there. Uh, 23 squared minus 18 squared. 23 squared minus 18 squared. It gives me 205. And then, just like before, we square root. So we get x equals the square root of 205 is 14.32. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. 23 is the hypotenuse. That's longer than 14. This makes sense. All right. We add the squares together when we're finding the hypotenuse. We subtract the squares when we're finding a like. All right. Next problem for Pythagorean is determining if the triangle is right. We struggle with this problem a little bit on our, on our assessment for this. A lot of kids went, yeah, that looks like a right triangle to me. Drew in the right triangle symbol and said, I'm good. That's not good enough. Okay. 10. Um, we have to put it into the Pythagorean theorem. C is always going to be the longest side. So I'm going to go ahead and say 10 squared plus 14 squared equals 20 squared. Now, this is where we go and we check it. We're going to put the left side into the calculator, the right side into the calculator, and see what we get. So 10 squared plus 14 squared equals 296. 20 squared equals 400. So 296 does not equal 400. Okay, so the answer to my question is no, not a right triangle. Okay, this is not right because it does not fit the Pythagorean theorem. All right, find the length of a segment on the coordinate grid. Okay, this is simple. We draw a triangle. We make it a right triangle because if we make a right triangle, we can calculate this distance by making x, y the hypotenuse to a right triangle. So this length over here is 2. This length is 7. This is our C. This is automatically a right triangle making that C. So we have 2 squared plus 7 squared equals C squared. Now we can go to our calculator and we can solve this. We can figure out what's the answer. So 2 squared plus 7 squared is 53. We square root the answer. We get 7.28. So the answer, xy, is equal to 7.28. And that makes sense. Okay, Pythagorean theorem. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. When we're finding a hypotenuse, we're going to add the squares together before we square roots because that is going to make it larger. When we're finding a leg like in number two, we're going to end up subtracting. All right, exponent rules, okay? These problems are slightly challenging, but, but we can do them. we got to remember what we're doing here, okay? So I always reorder things next to each other that are like. So I'm going to move my threes and my fives next to each other. Really, I should have put my threes first. So let's go ahead and fix that. If I have four threes and seven threes, I have 11 threes. We add the exponents here. And just like we did with the threes, if I have two fives and five fives, I have seven fives. So that is our simplified answer. Okay, right here. That is simplified. We have one of each base. Now, the second week we talked about this, I threw in um, some coefficients, the four and the five, and some variables. Same process. Write what's next to each other, or what's like each other next to each other. So four times five times x to the fifth times x to the seventh. So what is four times five? Well, so many kids were trying to apply the properties of exponents, but we're just multiplying. Four times five is 20. And then x, how many x's do I have? Five x's and seven x's. I add those together and get 12 x's. Okay, so just like on the other one, we have completely simplified this. All right, now power to power. 
This is where we multiply the exponents. Don't forget, everything needs an exponent, including that eight. So I'm gonna take the two times the three. Remember, this three out here is going to multiply everything. So I'm gonna get six twos, 12 fives, and three eights. Because four times three is 12, two times three is six, one times three is three. That is completely simplified. All right, now, exponents and coefficients and variables gets a little confusing. Don't forget that five has a one. We still have to multiply each of those things on the inside by two. So one times two is two. Three times two is six. Now, not simplified, okay? Before, on the previous problem, we would leave two to the sixth power, and we were okay with that, and five to the twelfth. But here, when we have variables, we want to simplify that. So what is 5 squared? Well, it's just 25. So this is our most complete answer. All right. Quotient of power. When we have quotients, we when we do quotients, that means divide. When we're dividing things with exponents, when they have the same base, we can simply subtract their exponents. So we should have 11 to the fifth times 12 to the third. Seven minus two is five, five minus two is three. Same thing here with our x and y, it doesn't change anything. We're simply going to subtract the exponents of the like basis. So we're gonna end up with x equals five, or sorry, not x equals five, x to the fifth, y to the second. Seven minus two is five, five minus three is two. Okay, now here, this last example, this is kind of what gave us the most difficulty is the negative exponents. Hopefully we're gonna start to kind of figure this out and be okay with it. That seven is still gonna multiply. So we're gonna end up with a to the 21st, three times seven is 21, negative two times seven is negative 14. Now, this is the case where mathematicians say, I don't like negative exponents, but you guys struggled with this because you always wanted this either, some of you either wanted to send something to the bottom, even when there was no negative exponents, or you were sending the wrong thing or whatever. But the, the B has to go to the bottom of the fraction. We change the exponent positive when we change its location. All right, this last one, no different than a previous example, 10 times four times N to the negative seventh times N to the 12th. Now here, we're gonna multiply 10 times four and then we are gonna combine our ends. So 10 times four is 40. Negative seven plus 12 is five. The negative exponent went away, so we're good. We don't have to send anything to the bottom. We can just leave this as our most simplified um, problem here. All right, now, scientific notation. You literally finished a quick check, check on this minutes ago. So this should be freshest in your head. Remember, a times 10 to the nth, where a is between one and 10. So this says determine if a number is in scientific notation, okay? This one is, okay? I'm gonna use a blue check mark, okay? Both the eight, the 10, and the negative five all work. The second one is not. Why is that? The 58, okay? 58 is not between one and 10. Same with the next one. 0 0.93 is less than one. So this one doesn't work. And then the last one, 6.4, that's between one and 10 times 10 to the first, fourth. So that works. All right, now the next problem is converting into scientific notation. We take the first three numbers from the left. We write them down, 4.6, not two. We look at the eight, three times 10. And we gotta figure out how many times did we move our decimal place to get it between the four and the six. So it started here after the two, it ended between the four and the six. So now I have to count. Okay, so I'm very simply gonna count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Well, I don't know why I got a little line there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it becomes 10 to the seventh power. Same thing, 
Take the first three numbers, 6.71. Now we have to count how many times did it go from where it begun to between the six and the seven. So it's going to end here. It started here. All we have to do is count how many, how many place values did we move it? One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, that's a small number, so we weren't multiplying 6.71 by 10, we were dividing, so that needs to be a negative exponent. All right, next one, converting into standard form. We write down five, two, three. We move our decimal place. One, two, three, four, five. We replace it with the zeros, and then rewrite the problem for me. Okay, so don't be lazy. Rewrite the answer, five, two, three, zero, zero, zero. If you wanna put a decimal place in, that goes at the end. We moved it to the end, so this is 523,000. All right, last one, eight, six. The decimal place starts between the eight and the six. We move it smaller, one, two, three. That's where the decimal place ends. Zero, zero. Again, rewrite the question, the answer, so I can tell what you're doing. Point zero zero eight six. Very, very simple. All right, now, last type of question is going to be a determine how many times greater. Okay, so when we're determining how many times greater, we are going to divide. So this says determine how many times greater the population of Kentucky was than the population of North Dakota. So Kentucky's got to go on the top. North Dakota has to go on the bottom, okay? We go to our calculator, we do the division, we round our answer to the nearest tenth. So 4.47, remember, hit the fraction button first, times 10 to the sixth, divided by, I gotta flip back here, 7.62 times 10 to the fifth. We're rounding to the, oop, that's wrong fifth. So to the nearest tenth, this would be 5.9 times larger. Okay. Great job following along. Listen. I hope you listened to my words and you followed along and you wrote, look at all we've learned in the first quarter. Remember, test coming next week. Two questions. I gave you kind of 16 questions here, four by four, four concepts, four questions. I will be selecting two from each concept. You will be getting a five point grade on your mastery of each concept out of 20, okay? This is not meant to be a punitive thing that like knocks your grade down, but it is meant for us. The whole purpose is go back and remember what you learned because it, it matters. In high school geometry, in two years, they're going to expect you to know the Pythagorean theorem and be able to apply it. So it benefits you to learn it again now. All right, well done today. 